Welcome back to Untaming Masculinity, the podcast where we tackle issues relevant to men and their journeys to reclaim their masculinity. I'm Dan, and I'm joined with my co-host, Brad. How are you doing today? I'm great. Just another night wrestling my kids into bed. <laughs> chaos. I feel like every time I get on, I talk about the chaos, but good. How are well, you? I'm pretty good. It's been a, a little rough week. If you can, I don't know if I sound it, but I've been uh, sick, so excuse me if I, if I cough or sneeze tonight. Yeah, other than that, pretty good week. Uh, we are joined tonight by a good friend of ours. He is a man who kind of does it all. He's a strength and nutrition coach. He was America's Strongest Man in 2020 and is currently making the switch over to bodybuilding. He's Mr. Anthony Deal. What's up? Welcome to the, welcome to the show, Anthony. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So we wanted to bring you on tonight and just, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of places we can go with conversation with you, but why don't you spend a little bit of time just telling us about you, you know, kind of where you got started, what you're doing now and uh, yeah. everything in between. I have a weird story because uh, I didn't really, you know, I'm a strength and nutrition coach, but I didn't go to school for this. Uh, my degree is actually in theology with a minor in Greek. So if you need me to read some old dead languages, I can do that for you. Um I, I went to I went to college, met my wife there. I uh, we went to the same school and um, we moved to Kentucky after we got married. And while we're young newlyweds, I'm pursuing my master's degree. I just started lifting. I'd, I'd been lifting for a while. And how I got into strongman is one day a friend said, hey, we're doing farmer's carries out back. Do you want to join us? I was like, yeah, sure. And I go out there. I didn't know what it was. And my friend, his name is Weston. He's like, 70 pounds lighter than me. And he takes off just sprinting with like 200 pounds in each hand. So I thought, all right, well, if he can do that, I'm going to smoke him. <laughs> and I picked it up and I was like a drunk baby deer, just waddling. I'm like, this is really <laughs> hard. And, but I'm a very competitive person. And I hated that this dude who was so much smaller than me was better than me at this thing. I had no reason to pursue getting better at it other than the fact that I just didn't like how much I sucked. And he was like, well, <laughs> he's like, well, we train strongman every Saturday at so-and-so's house and he lives right by you. Just, just come over. So I went over and, um, we just had a blast. I've never touched strongman. I'd watched it growing up. So I'd seen like Marius Bujanowski and watched, you know, world strongest man on TV. So I had some concept of what it was, but I know I, I never had any aspirations to do it. Um, but it was fun right away. It was a fun group of guys. I'm like, yeah. And so what turned into, you know, showing up every Saturday for a few months. And then this one guy says, Hey, there's a competition. And I signed you up. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, sweet. So I went to my first show and it was just a blast and the camaraderie and stuff. Everybody's you're trying to win, of course, but everybody's cheering for you and, you know, trying to push you along. And it was so fun. And the second I did that first contest, I'm like, Oh man, this is, this is a thing I'm going to be really interested in. And um, I started pursuing it and did that for a few years. And as I was doing that, I started to move up the ranks and realized like, oh, I'm getting pretty decent at this. I really enjoy it. Um, so I turned pro in 2019. Uh, that's when I earned my pro card at nationals. And then, like you said, I won America's Strongest Man in 2020. Where the coaching comes in is um, every role that I've had. So at this point, I'd been working in operations management at Starbucks. Um, and at some point, I transitioned over to Amazon as well. And every role that I had, I was always a teacher, mentor, training store manager. I like working with people, helping develop their careers, uh, whatever the case might be. And so I've always taught people something. And I was really growing to love this whole strength thing. And so I started taking people on for free just because like, hey, I'll write you a program for this competition. And they started to do well. So I started to get some results. And so I started to charge a little bit. It wasn't a lot. And I started to grow and started to scale. And then where nutrition comes in is actually up to that point, I was a typical meathead, man. Like I just wanted to be strong and I didn't care what it took. So I would just eat anything in sight, right? Like the seventies diet, just meat, eggs, and milk. And I got pretty chunky to be perfectly honest with you. I was strong, but I was like the Michelin man strong. Um, and what happened was my middle son Haddon was diagnosed with autism. And in that process of trying to help him, we just started going down every rabbit hole. And one of the things we learned was that nutrition has a big impact. And one of the best things that we could have done for him was eliminate foods that are inflammatory. 
So I never thought that we would be like a gluten-free, dairy-free household just because I'm a country boy and I like my meat and potatoes. But we did. We transitioned over to um, gluten-free stuff for his sake and his speech therapy took off. And I just remember in my training, the only variable that changed was my nutrition. Nothing else changed. And my training took off. I mean, I was like hitting PRs constantly, getting more athletic. I was losing weight. And so it clicked with me that like nutrition um, can drive performance. And this, the tide started shifting in strength sports, I would say around 2015. It used to be that if you were a strength athlete, you were just kind of big and sloppy, but super strong. And the shredded guys were the bodybuilders or the CrossFitters. But a few athletes like Dan Green, who's an elite level power lifter, were also had great physiques and nutrition was coming into play, but it really wasn't big. And I started going down that rabbit hole. So then I started coaching people in nutrition for performance. Um, and so I would say even today, one of the things that I lead with in all of my coaching is I firmly believe that a healthy athlete is a better performing and better looking athlete as well. Um, but you got to be healthy systemically. So that's a, that's like the abbreviated version of how I got into this. And as the coaching scaled, I reached a point where I had to decide whether I was all in on creating my own business to, to coach or sticking with the corporate world. And I'm super thrilled with the decision I've made because it's stressful sometimes, but I absolutely love it. I've been doing that now full-time since 2018. And that's awesome. So here's, here's the question I've been sitting on since you first brought that up. How long was it from the point that you took, you did those farmer carries with 200 pounds until you were entered into your first competition? Uh, three months. What? Oh, dude, it was, it was like right away. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, man. I, and then once I did the first competition, the bug had bit me and there was no looking back. Uh, and I've probably, I think I've comp- I totaled it up one time. I competed, like, I think I've competed 37 times in total over the last eight years. So wow. I've put my body through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So yeah, and you've, you've seen some wear and tear in that too. I, I have. I've you're, you're sustained a lot of before. injuries. Yeah, I've sustained a lot of injuries. And it's funny, um, none of the injuries I've sustained have been like cool. <laughs> like, oh, he was <laughs> oh, he was going for this world record deadlift and you know, whatever towards hamstring. No, no, they're all stupid. Like literally all <laughs> All of them are like user error. <laughs> uh, I remember when I was at Amazon, uh, one of my my coworkers was like, oh, I ran track in high school. I bet I could beat you in a race. And I was like, here's the thing. If we're racing like a mile or two, you'll beat me. If we're racing 100 yards, if we're sprinting, I will smoke you all day. And because I was fast and I was conditioned. And uh, and they're like, all right, we're going to do this at lunch. I'm like, okay. And it was actually, ironically, it was the day after I deadlifted 700 for the first time in my life. And so it's probably a little sore and I go out and I'm in jeans and Crocs, zero warm up, ready, set, go. And we just take off. And I've absolutely smoked this guy. He goes, Oh, I want to do it again. And I'm like, fine. I'll even give you a head start. So I give him like a five yard head start. I take off and I am, I don't know, 10 steps into it. And I just right, right. As I lift my leg, it was just like a zipper. And it felt like someone just stabbed a knife in my hamstring. Just, and it's oh. just ripped that hamstring. That was gnarly. But I, here's the sick part. I kept running, so I beat him and then <laughs> fell. And <laughs> I'm a little competitive. So, so that that kind of sucked because I had to pull out of my next competition. Um, yeah, I've, I've, just, I've, torn, I've torn a hamstring. Uh, I've torn this pec, torn this bicep, rotator cuff, AC joint, a few things here and there. A few things. <laughs> yes. It's part of it. Like you do what you can to avoid injuries, but I think if you're in it long enough and you push hard enough, you know, it's kind of unavoidable at some point. So something I was thinking about as you were telling your story just overall is you could argue in some ways you kind of stumbled into where you are currently. Dude. uh, Yeah. I would have never guessed in a billion years, even when I fell in love with strongman, I just assumed, Oh, this is just going to be a hobby. Um, And when I started coaching, it was, well, this is fun and I and I like it. And this is a nice little side income. If anything, I viewed it almost as funding my hobby. Because strongman isn't if you're traveling to competitions, buying weight belts and all kinds of other stuff, um, you know, it can get expensive. And so I just viewed it as kind of a way to pay for what I love to do too. And because I loved it, it didn't feel burdensome. Um, but I definitely reached a point where I my eyes started to be open and I thought, wow, I could really 
I could make a go of this and be my own boss. Um, I would like to say that I had the courage to take the leap. It was, it was really forced on me. And I, I'll tell you that story is an interesting story. Um, so I, I don't believe in being a victim. I'm not a victim. It turned out the best thing in the world, but uh, I am, I am kind of a victim of cancel culture. So when I was working at Amazon, I had a great boss. He was awesome. Uh, there came a point where uh, I had offended the wrong people <laughs> through some political fuse. Go figure. Um, Cause I'm not opinion. I'm not opinionated at all. Right. Um, and I, so here's the, here's the true story because of my belief uh, as a, as a Christian and I didn't support I didn't support homosexuality. I don't think I'm better than homosexuals. What they wanted was all the leaders. I was a group manager directly in charge of uh, around 200 people. And we always had to do community service projects. And they wanted us to um, do something at the, the pride rally downtown in Lexington. And I said, here's the deal. If we're serving and we're raking leaves, picking up trash, painting buildings, I'm down to serve all day long. I'll serve anybody. I don't care who they are, what they believe. I don't care. I said, but if you're asking me to play a role in endorsement, I can't do that. And so I was the only group manager who refused to go and I didn't go. And that angered the wrong people. And so they found um, some posts I made on Facebook, like literally two years before and escalated them up the chain because I was a senior leader at Amazon, uh, created this whole stir. Well, long story short, my boss was furious. He didn't think I should be in trouble at all. And he was forced to terminate me. But my, uh, my human resources manager also didn't agree with the decision. And so they gave me six month severance. And this is right when I was deciding whether or not I'm going to leave. And I was terrified to leave because Amazon was the first, um, it was the first job I ever had where I was making great money and could see a future for myself as supporting my family, great benefits and stock options. So, but my client load was getting really heavy and I'm like, man, I could go either way here. Um, and that six month severance gave me the tools, the time to really pour all myself into my business to make it grow. I was like, you have six months to basically bring your business up to what you were doing with Amazon. And it, and it happened within about three. So I, that it worked out really well. Um, and it was funny too. And then I, then I took at the end of the six months, then I took Amazon to court for wrongful termination and won because they never actually made me sign a social media policy. They, there was one, but I never affixed my name to it. And I was like, you cannot prove that. And I was correct. And it was really funny because all my colleagues like uh, are still kept in touch with me. Like literally like two days after that, they're like, dude, Amazon everywhere shut down for like an hour today, pulled everyone in and made everyone in the company sign this new social media policy. And I was like, sweet. I affected some change at Amazon back in 2018. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, I wish I could tell this cool story like I was, you know, I just made this leap of faith and took a bet on myself. I don't know if I would have without that. My wife was cheering me on, um, but I had no choice. I got terminated from my job and I was like, well, I'm not going to go search for another job. I'm just going to give this a go and really push. And my coaching, my coaching took off. So um, through what some might see as an unfortunate event uh, was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. In the sense that you're saying that it wasn't, yeah, it might not be sexy, but <laughs> you have convictions. You stuck sure. to those convictions. There's a certain belief system within yourself that you refuse to deviate from. And because you chose to that, you chose to yeah. be a man of integrity that led you there. Yeah, I guess, I guess you could say so. I mean, I, it was, it was really sad too, because the particular people that I, ups, that I upset, I worked really hard to let them know like, Hey, this is not, I don't think I'm better than you in any way, shape or form. Um, I just have personal convictions and beliefs that I can't, I can't cross certain lines. And I feel like what they were asking me to do wasn't service, right? Like they were asking me to endorse through my activities there. And I was like, man, if it was a true service project, I don't care. I'll serve anybody. I don't care who it is or what they believe, but I can't put my endorsement behind something that I don't know, don't believe. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. Turned out well for me in the long run. That's yeah. a, it's a powerful story. You know, and it, it's, it's interesting because I, I think stories like that are more prevalent than you think. I know 
more than a few people who have started their own businesses because of you know recent things and mm. in an interview with having to get shots and uh sure and not wanting to and, and losing their jobs because of it and then going striking out on their own so i think that that kind of situation is actually a a more common catalyst for new businesses being started than than people may think oh it's true i mean the idea like scarcity is going to drive innovation sort of things right. it's like sometimes you you're forced to do something different so absolutely yeah i was definitely forced to <laughs> and i was forced to act <laughs> quick man i was forced to act quick because i was like oh man i got these three kids i'm supporting like yeah. ooh, we got to make a go of it from a from a business standpoint where do you start with that you said you started with you know just kind of doing programs on and off with some friends at first or, or mm -hmm. be new and then and then slowly charging like was it stuff that you had learned in, in the business world and how to scale that up? Like, how did you, how did you make that next step? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I screwed up a lot. Um, in fact, uh, well, I'll get to this in a second. So I think one of the things that made me successful was I'm very thankful for my years at Starbucks because I had some awesome, awesome bosses who um, really took time to teach and mentor me. Uh, didn't just say, Hey, go do this. Cause I said, but really taught me business and so I had spent almost a decade managing multi millions of dollars and hiring and firing tons of people. And so they, and they made me such effective lead, such a more effective leader, um, taught me how to vary my leadership style, taught me how to have tough conversations, just things that, um, that translate to any leadership situation. Like I'm confident now there's a steel mill down the road. I could go get hired on as some supervisor position, not have a clue what they do, but I know how to build relationships with people. And I know I could positively influence them because I'm confident in my ability to influence others and lead people through mm -hmm. service. Right. And so, um, so there was that time. Now the thing about Starbucks is I started, when we first got married, I just needed insurance and Starbucks had benefits for part-time employees. So I'm going to grad school and working part-time. Uh, and again, this is like right around 2008, I guess, when the economy is still kind of recovering from the housing bubble boom. And, um, and uh, yeah, so it, it was just, it was an interesting time. And it was also a time when work ethic seemed to just really start taking a dive. Like all I did was show up one time and try, and they promoted me to a, a supervisor in like three months. And so I started and rose through the ranks at Starbucks from the ground up. So I was leading from a place of subject matter expertise. When I jumped over to Amazon, I was recruited and it was terrifying because I was put into a leadership position, not having ever worked in a customer service center in my life. And so now, so now I'm not leading from subject matter expertise. I'm leading from a place of influencing people and I'm having to go and build relationships and build trust that I don't have through expertise. So I learned at Starbucks, running businesses effectively, leading people. Amazon, I learned to lead differently and how to gain trust. But then also Amazon is a, you know obviously the, one of the largest tech companies. And what was drilled into our heads is that you never make a decision without data. And so those things, those skills and abilities translated really well into my coaching. And I still screwed up a lot. I screwed up everything from Pricing, I priced way too low for way too long. Um, lots of things I could go into that I screwed up, but I learned and was able to self-correct. But I always related well to people. Mm -hmm. So in the years I've been coaching, I think I've had one unsatisfied person. Like anytime anybody leaves, my average retention is around three years. Anytime anyone leaves, it's always on great terms. Like, hey, coach, you know, I've had an awesome time learning from you. I think I'm ready to do this on my own. I think I've never any any bad terms. And so my ability to relate with people, I think is important because it builds trust. If they trust me, they're going to adhere to the plan. If they adhere to the plan, then I can do my job better, make better decisions, and we get better results. It's a win for everybody. So I think I think my years in the corporate world helped me a ton, to be perfectly honest. In so many ways, when you think of the corporate environment, it's learning how to manage different individuals and different styles of personalities. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to motivate, learning how to inspire. Yeah. Um, and obviously with coaching, there's so much of that involved. Is that it's the same thing? Yeah. It's the same thing, you know, and, and my boss used to say, you know, flexing your approach. That was always his phrase. Um, or a lot of times too, the temptation in coaching is 
or in leadership positions and you go and you see something broken and you know the right answer. And so you just want to fix, but instead taking the time to ask leading questions so that that person in charge or whatever the case, your subordinate, even if it takes longer, ask leading questions so that they have the light bulb moment for themselves. So I'll do that a lot in my coaching when I'm watching a video back of a deadlift, instead of saying, Oh, Hey, you came forward on your toes on that second rep. I'll, I'll say, Hey, so-and-so I want you to watch this back. And I want you to tell me the difference between rep two and the rest of the reps. See if you can spot any differences. And oftentimes it'll spur a good conversation like, oh, oh yeah, I came forward on that rep. Yeah, well, why does that matter? Well, because, and then we can get into this discussion more than just me saying, hey, your second rep, you were off, like stay back on your heels, right? Um, and so just those little things that lessons that I remember from that world translating over into the coaching world. And I'm actually working on a project right now. It should launch by July, but I'm designing a course for up and coming coaches. Um, and it's basically going to try and bridge that gap that I see is that you can get a degree in kinesiology, exercise science, nutrition, dietetics, whatever. And uh, nobody teaches you how to run a business, how to be an effective leader, how to have difficult conversations. Um, and it's not being taught at all. And so the success rate for a fitness professional in the United States is 20%. It's 80% turnover. And if you make $60,000 a year, you're in the top 1%, which is sad. Wow. And wow. so hopefully that I, I did a pilot program back in the fall and then um, I'm, I'm neck deep in content editing and filming and all that, but that should be live in July. So we'll hopefully that will help some people out in this exact area. It's great, man. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing how uh, transferable a lot of those skills are, right? Because, I mean, you're talking about the, you know, the fitness and nutrition world. I see the same things in, in the manufacturing world. Uh, I'm sure Brad sees it in the tech world. It's just the, the, the ability to have conversations with people, have those difficult conversations like you're talking about, and to also not just be the guy to be like, you know, do this and do this and, and do it this way, but rather teach people or even have them come to their that conclusion by themselves, you know, kind of guide them through the path. Right. It's just, it's huge in building relationships and, and building a team. And I'm looking at it also as it helps build your backfill so that as you move up, you've got somebody kind of filling behind you in a, in a more corporate structure, and, right? And, you know, go up. So. Yep. hundred percent. So going back to the early days of your coaching business, tell us a little bit about the first victory you got, maybe like the first client you had that saw success. Maybe it was somebody who had had a breakthrough that they thought not that wasn't possible. I mean, how did that kind of fortify you and build you to where you are now? Well, I mean, I, I had a lot of confidence that I could help people. Uh, it's it's tough being a coach when you're doing fitness and nutrition because um, you can write the best plan, but at the end of the day, the the biggest variable for success is it's their control, it's their effort. I can't force that. And especially in the early days when I was trying to build a reputation of somebody who gets results, I was doing it for free. And the problem is when people do things for free, there's there's no level of investment, right? So for me, I was just excited to get, I remember I trained like, I offered like eight guys a program to increase their bench press and like three stuck with it. Right. And I just remember being excited because the three that stuck with it actually saw really significant positive growth hit 20, 30, 40 pound PRs. So, okay, cool. I know I can do this. Right. If the people stick with the plan. Uh, and that was one of the things I ran into early on was when I didn't price high enough. Uh, I tell coaches this all the time. If you don't have people regularly telling you, Hey, I'm sorry, I just can't afford that right now. You're not, you're not priced high enough because it's got to be more than a Netflix subscription type attitude where your costs are just auto debited from their card each month. They don't even think about it because then they're just going to view you and your plan as something to be used when they want to and something to be discarded when they don't want to. And they are a walking billboard for your services. Right, especially in this day and age, when oftentimes with fitness and training, you're tr you're tagging your coach and somebody else on Instagram. I have fired clients before for going off program. I've given them a couple warnings, but it's usually young college bros, right? They just want to max out and think girls actually care when they don't. It's just like five other gym bros that care. But <laughs> but like I see them maxing out bench press on Instagram, and I'm like, hey man, that's not in the program. And you know, I warn them a couple times, but I'm like, my reputation is worth way more than your Instagram clout. 
like, get out of here, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's a long winded answer. So, so other than the price of your, your services, how do you determine whether a client is a good fit for you? Cause I mean, obviously, like you said, right, your reputation is based on the results that they get. So you want to make sure that you're picking up clients that you sure. see the future in. Yeah. Well, it's nice now because uh, one, I, I require like a three month commitment, right? Um, there's that, the higher price point that I have, and I have, I have things at multiple price points so people can come in at different levels and they get a level, a little bit different level of investment back from me, different services and things. Um, the higher price point helps, but what really helps is now that I'm this far into my career, I very rarely advertise, maybe once every couple months. Um, most of my clients are word of mouth. And so if it's word of mouth from a friend, they're already having conversations about the kind of coach I am and my expectations anyways. And so I kind of already trust that if so-and-so is sending me this person, but I do uh, face-to-face interviews with people um, just to, just to make sure. And it's, it's been very rare that I've turned somebody away. Um, But again, I think the higher price point is a pretty good barrier. Like they're not, you know, if you're, if you're $75 a month, somebody might gamble on that, but I'm at a place now, right. For strength and nutrition is three twenty five dollars a month. And for some people that might not be anything, but for a lot of people, they're going to have to adjust some stuff in their budget and really commit to that. And so that kind of, that alone will weed people out. I think that's something that I've learned in talking to a lot of friends who started businesses is you price yourself too low and you're just not going to attract the kind of clientele that you want. Right. It's, it's tricky. Well, it's tricky because when you're starting out too, you want any business that you can get. And oftentimes we will assume our personal financial values and we'll project those onto other people. And we think, well, I would never pay $325 a month for coaching. Maybe you wouldn't, but somebody else would. And they're driving around with $800 a month car payment. Like you can't assume what other people value, right? Maybe somebody just, you know, I worked with a client that we started when he was 440 pounds and his doctor told him he'd be dead in a heart attack in a couple of years if he didn't change his life. And so he had no problem shelling out. He, I have a plan uh, that's $500 a month and it includes a lot more than a regular plan. And he has no problem shelling that out. And we've dropped 140 pounds off of him because he's serious and it matters because he wants to be there for his grandkids. So yeah, it's important to learn not to project your personal ideas of spending onto other people. And I think in a lot of ways, it's imposter syndrome, right? I mean, if you're starting uh, off a business, who am I to be able to charge that amount of money? Or who am I to ask that of somebody else? I just wrote about imposter syndrome today in the content for my class. That's that's one of the biggest things that stops people. Because we also assume our level of knowledge onto others, right? And so we just don't. We think, well, people already know that. Well, maybe, but who cares? Because you know, certain people in your life are looking at you. You have a certain sphere of influence that I don't. And maybe our spheres of influence overlap because we have some mutual friends, but you have a unique perspective, a unique background, and a unique way of wording things that might connect with somebody that's not going to connect with, you know, that I can't connect with because of how I approach it. And so I find this all the time. I mean, I run into this. I've had this idea of making this business plan, this this coaching uh, piece for a couple of years, and I haven't done it for those exact reasons. And I catch myself all the time. I was going to make a video the other day on why elevating your toes in an RDL is really not effective. And then I saw, um, I saw Paul Car- Paul Carter, who's a he's a good friend of mine, but he's hundreds of thousands of followers, writes for T Nation. He made the same exact video, and I thought I'm not going to put that out there because Paul already put it out. Like, why would I do that? Um, and then I thought, you know what? I went and clicked on Paul's page. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, dude, we have like 60 people that overlap. That's it. And again, I might say it and explain it in a slightly different way that reaches some people that it connects with. Because I can't guarantee that everybody saw Paul's post. Some people might see mine and maybe it's valuable information to share. And so uh, just share it. <laughs> you know, just do it. Everybody, you can add value. And in the fitness and nutrition space, space especially, we have like no overhead, man. I told somebody last night when I was doing a business consulting call, it's like the only thing that you are risking right now is your pride. <laughs> That's it. You're not, you're not, you're not sourcing investors. You're not taking out loans. You're risking your pride. So if you can set that aside, go for it. You know? Yeah. That's it. That's uh that ego, right? It'll always no, kind of bite you. Dude, it always does. It kills you. But yeah, I still I'd I'd be a liar if I said I didn't deal with imposter syndrome. I'm better at killing it now. 
I'm better at acting anyway, but the thought comes into my head probably daily. Like, who are you to do X? And I'm like, ah, shut up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess kind of diving into that, you you tell that voice, that, like that inner bitch voice, just right. shut up. Yeah. Do you think that that was trained? How did you get to that point? Because obviously you didn't start there, but you're here now. Yeah, I think you can learn resilience. Um, and it's funny because people see me and they see my athletic endeavors and go, oh, you're so disciplined. And oftentimes it's such a conviction to me because I can see all the areas of my life where I'm not disciplined. And I go, I'm disciplined because I'm psychotic enough to love that. And it manifests itself physically. So then, so it creates this image of discipline. But then I go, I look at all the other areas in my life where I'm lazy AF and I'm like, come on. Or I back out of doing what I know I should do. And I procrastinate on things. Um, it's funny. Like I, I called myself out on our, you know, I last week when I was sick, I mean, I was sick. Um, and I bailed on our call last week, last Tuesday. But then as I was filling out my, I was posting my numbers. I thought, man, you were a little bitch because you bailed on the call but I didn't miss a day of training and I got all my cardio in. I'm out on the treadmill, literally sneezing and just like filling tissues, feeling like shit, but it mattered so much to me because I have this goal that I was willing to suffer for it, but I wasn't willing to suffer for an hour to better myself and potentially be called out. I just wanted to go to bed and take NyQuil. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think you can learn resilience, but I'm constantly learning resilience, man. I'm just constantly fighting it. And, you know, I think as you grow, you have people around you. In our case, you know, guys on the IC that are pushing you and challenging you. So, I mean, I, I comply, unfortunately, with that inner bitch voice a lot. I just try to never give up, you know, it's just a little yeah. bit better every day. It's, it's a constant fight, right? Yeah. So I want to kind of change gears a little bit here and talk about um you know we talk a lot about masculinity and becoming a better man and invariably in our conversations the the concept of physical fitness comes in and right you know the the idea that physical fitness is kind of a, a gateway drug to a strenuous life right yeah. i want to kind of get your thoughts on that and see you know why you think that is <clears throat> or if you agree with it and if you do why you think that is I think it's definitely a gateway um, because a lot of people aren't doing strenuous things. We live in a really comfortable culture. And so I think sometimes it can be a boost for people to go out and do something hard and go, I can do that. So if I can do that really hard thing, what else can I do in my life? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I absolutely believe that, but I know for, for people like me, it's so ingrained in a part of who I am that sometimes what can happen is, I can kind of ride my own coattails of being physically elite, so to speak, but then use that as an excuse to justify laziness in other areas. So I think there's a double-edged sword there. I totally agree with it. But for us meatheads who live this life day in and day out, it doesn't even feel like a sacrifice because it's so part of who we are. But everybody else thinks, look at them. You know, they're like this elite athlete. So they must have their life like totally together. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, so I totally I agree. Completely, yeah. my, my wife struggled for a lot of years with, with depression. And when she started getting physically active, that was a key for her transition and for her transition out of that. And so now she's physically active and it's led to so many other areas of progress in her life. I mean, at this point, I think she's reading more than I am. Like she's reading constantly, trying to better herself, trying to just. And so, yeah, I totally agree with that. But um, certain, I have to be careful that I don't just be like, oh, well, I got the physical fitness down. I'm good. The concept that we typically talk about is how the, the discipline that you build starting a physical fitness journey can translate into other parts of your life. I, I'd never actually considered the point where you're talking about where you become so entrenched in it that you use it to justify not being disciplined yeah. elsewhere that's, because that's nobody else is going to see it, man. Like we see you riding your bike. We see you getting after it in jujitsu because people post about it, but nobody sees you being lazy with your money and making poor decisions. And, you know, nobody sees you being lazy with spending time with your kids or your wife or whatever else. So it's really easy to project this outward image of masculinity um, and, and to be honest, it's easy to live up to an image and then just hide all this stuff in the background. 
So okay. I totally agree with it, like the importance of it, 100%. But I just, I know for me, I got to be careful that I don't just, you know, project a certain image and then leave a bunch of other stuff un- undealt with. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if you think in a, from a bigger picture perspective, it's not all that dissimilar from the intellectual who can read a bunch of books, the, mm. you know, like the pastor, for example, who is well-versed in scripture and has a good relationship with Christ, but they fail as a father, which comes Ooh. back to, are they really that tuned with, with Christ? Mm-hmm. There are different ways you can look at that. It's just with, I think in your world, it's a little different in the sense of so much can be attributed to the physical appearance of somebody. I look at Anthony, I'm like, oh, Anthony's jacked. Okay, cool. He's got some stuff put together. Whereas I look at that guy who might be a scholar, he's very well read, but he's 300 pounds and sloppy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I see where you're coming from, but at the same time, it's almost as if every single person has, has it in them to put in the work in some area of their life, but what they should be doing is projecting that elsewhere. And so many people don't. Mm -hmm. I know plenty of people that are jacked and uh, completely irresponsible. (laughs) Right. In so many areas of their life. And on the outside, they'd be like, oh, that's that's peak masculinity. And I'm going, man, I would I, I would rather the dad that at least is faithful and tries to get out there and do a couple push ups and go for some walks and stuff. But it's pouring into his kids and whatever else, but doesn't necessarily look like Superman. You know, I think being physically fit is so important. I, mean, I love it. It's my life. It's all I do. So I'd be stupid to to sit here and try to undersell it. Um, but yeah, I just know that I have to personally be careful because it's really easy for me. I mean, on Instagram, I can just post pictures of lifting and post pictures of Jocko talking about get some, and I can be up at 4 a.m. doing cardio and post pictures of my latest kill and just be like, yes, this is like a picture of masculinity and be a shit father and a terrible husband and, you know, manage my money horribly and whatever the case. So, uh, but yes, I absolutely do believe that people who their lives are falling apart <laughs> in, in some ways or just not together. Physical fitness could be a great start because it's something totally in your control. When it feels like everything else is falling apart, you can you can lace up those shoes and go for a run. You can get on the floor and do some push-ups. And that riding that momentum can lead you to other positive changes for sure. So I think there's just two sides to that coin. So I don't know if I stumbled onto them because of you. Or if I just happen to stumble onto them because I'm in the I'm in the the new hunter crowd. But tell us a little bit about your involvement with the hunt lift eat guys. Yeah, what yeah, you, those are what great you do with, those, with that team. Yeah, so Luke and I, Luke's the owner of Hunt Lift Eat. Uh, he started that lifestyle apparel company a couple of years ago, and um, he reached out to me to be part of their team. And it and he's really done a really good job of growing that business. I mean, it's it's starting to grow a lot. Um, I'm the only non-veteran member uh, of the team. All these guys are vets, a lot of them special forces. Uh, so we do some a lot of shooting and blowing stuff up every time we're together at hunting camp, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Um, in fact, Luke just deployed today. So he's heading over to somewhere overseas, over in Europe, dealing with the crisis. So praying for his uh, safe return. He has a newborn at home. But um yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the lift portion of the hunt, lift, eat. <laughs> uh, we, got, we got one other guy who is also into um, training and things like that. And so we kind of tag team together and write the, some of the fitness programs that we release, things like that. So i uh, been with those guys for like two years. So we get together at least once a year or so and uh, we'll hunt at their camp in Virginia. But we're, we've got a lot of different, they did an elk hunt, they did a caribou hunt. Uh, a couple of the guys are going lobster fishing this weekend. They just did a Texas pig hunt. So we have hunts lined up. It's like every month. Of course, I can't afford to go to all of them all the time, but uh, but it's nice because we're we're all getting after it and getting out there. So fun group of guys. Yeah, they're they're a good listener on a, a as a podcast too. So it's uh, yeah, their their podcast is new as well. They just started theirs. In fact, I was on the inaugural episode. It was Christmas of last year, so twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, we recorded it out in his uh, family's woodshed. It was like 40 degrees. Uh, we had a lot. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun. yeah. We were roughing it out there. It was great. We had a we had a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, and they're starting to line up some really cool guests. Um, yeah. We had Bert Soren on, so I was on there with Bert Soren a couple weeks ago. Got this shirt courtesy of him. Uh, that was a lot of fun. They just had um, 
oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Way of Man oh. author. Start the world on Instagram. Yeah, people buy the, Jack Donovan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know people buy their Instagram handles. Isn't that terrible? Um, so they just had him on. They just released that podcast today. So yeah, yeah, they're a good group of guys. I jump on occasionally, but I'm not on. I'm not on there faithfully. With all of this, the one thing that I keep coming back to is this sense that you've gotten really good at seizing opportunity. Things kind of. Sp- as we said earlier, yes, you stumbled into some things, but at the same time, you took advantage and seized those opportunities. So I guess from your experience, let guys know why seizing an opportunity is something that they should be actively trying to pursue. It's funny you say that because I see all the ways I've procrastinated or things that I'm doing now that I could have done so long ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 just important to it's important to seize the opportunities when they're there, work hard and be willing to fail. I think that's the reason I didn't, I was just scared to fail. Right. Um, But I get you. Are you even failing if, if you're learning something on the other end of it? Not really. So um, I think it's important just to take the risk and bet on yourself. And the worst case scenario is you learn something, you learn, you learn what doesn't work and you gain some valuable experiences and build some cool relationships with people and see where things go. Um, but yeah, I wish I wish I would take it more initiative. To be perfectly honest, and you know this this class, like I said, that I'm I'm working on right now, I've had this idea for like two years, and I finally just said, "Screw it, I need to I need to do it." Yeah, you know? and if it doesn't work out, what's the worst that can fail? Like, right, what's, what's the worst that can happen? You're out of right. grand. Yeah, I'm not even because the guy is developing my website. He's awesome. He's a really good friend, and I went to college with him, and this is what he does for a living: is he builds websites and. And he was like, all right, man, here's the total cost to build this out. It's going to be about around five grand. I was like, okay, cool. And uh, and then he replies back and he's like, dude, my wife and I both need some serious help with fitness and nutrition. He's like, I'll build this out, coach us for the next year. I was like, done. Done. Free market right there, guys. Right. <laughs> so that's the free market at work. I love capitalism. That's such a valuable lesson is I've, I've thrown up this term called catastrophizing before where we are always so guilty of assuming the worst that no matter what we undertake, the imposter that is inside of each and every one of us thinks that we're not up to it and that everything's going to go to shit if, if we fail. Yeah. And I think that that's a very, very, very valuable lesson is if we take a step back and really understand what we have to lose, if we don't take those steps, it's not that much. You're yeah. not going to lose your wife. You're not going to lose your house. You're not going to lose... Yeah. Your life, yeah. anything like that. These these things are generally pretty minimal. They might be financial. There might be some time involved. But ultimately, that failure, when you look back, if that's all that it is, those are life lessons. Those are things that you can apply in other elements of your life to help fortify you. Yeah. A couple of things here. There's a story that I, I go back to that I remember from my Starbucks days. Whenever we would launch a new coffee, we would always have a sales goal. And I was a busy drive through store. We, on average, we'd sell like 12 to 15 pounds of coffee a day. But uh, Christmas blend came out one year and we're like, all right, guys, we're going to sell 80 pounds of coffee. And I just remember telling the team, we see a thousand people in our drive through We're just going to ask everyone today if they'd like to purchase a pound of Christmas blend. And we're going to we're going to get 920 no's and that's totally okay. Cause all we want is the ADSs. So like you have to be willing to take the no's to get to the yeses and we would mark off every no. And every time we got a no, we're like, sweet, we're one no closer to a yes. Right. Like, I think it's, it's having that perspective, um, you know, be willing to be willing to suck. Nobody great at anything started out great. Everybody sucked when they started out. I mean, Jordan was cut from basketball teams. Seriously. Uh, you know, uh, Saviskas is one of the best strongmen of all times and uh, known for loading stones and pressing logs. And there's video footage of him as an amateur competitor, just totally biffing on the stone platform, like falling over and having a stone land on him, like just goofy things. Like you got to be willing to suck if you want to be great. So just embrace it. It's cool. It's part of it. Like you're going to be okay. Just go do it. So I have one final question for you. All right. How long was it before you beat your buddy in the farmer's carry? <laughs> I probably smoked him in like a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, look at that humble brag. I'm surprised it took you that I'll long. I'll just say, I'm how like, competitor you are. All right, my buddy Weston. If you ever listen to this, I love you, bro. Thanks for getting me into strongman. <laughs> oh man. So what's next? 
Yeah. Wow, um, you got the program. What else is going on? Um, just coaching, doing that. Um, training. Yeah. We talked about it briefly. I'm transitioning into bodybuilding right now. I absolutely love it. I've always wanted to do it. I think everybody at one point was like, man, I want to be like Arnold. And uh, I've coached it. So um, I've, I've always wanted to do it. And now it's the perfect time with some injuries that I had because bodybuilding is infinitely easier on my body. than strongman. Um, it's more mental discipline, which is good for me. Like the dietary discipline is crazy compared to strongman, but um, there's less of a time spend in strongman as well. So I feel like I get more time back with my family. Strongman was so weird because you're doing a lot of weird stuff. There's weird setup and all that and cleanup and whatnot. Whereas, I mean, a training session for strongman could be three hours. Whereas for bodybuilding, I'm in and out an hour and 15. Like I go in there, crush my sets, work really hard. And because it's, A lot of bodybuilding is a lot of supported machine and isolation work. You can work really hard and you get a muscular soreness, but I don't feel like I got hit by a truck all the time. Like I did with strongman. Like with strongman, I would want to come home and just sit on the couch and just do nothing. because I was so exhausted. Whereas with bodybuilding, I leave muscularly sore, but I'm energized and I feel good and I'm healthier because I'm doing cardio all the time. (laughs) Um, You know, my nutrition is on point, right? So, um, in a lot of ways, it's so much easier on my body. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited about that. So I'm 17 weeks out. Um, I'm not in the crazy hunger stages yet. I'm in a pretty steep caloric deficit. Well, for me, <laughs> for the average person, I'm probably still eating a lot of food. I'm still eating around like 3,500 calories. But um, I was around 6,000 calories in January. I got up to 275 in body weight. And now I'm down to like 252. And I'll probably get on stage around 225, something like that. So. Still got a good bit, still got a good bit to peel off, but yeah, that's oh, yeah. 17 and a half weeks, 17 and a half weeks. weeks ago. Oh man. And it's about a pound and a half a week. It's pretty good. Um, it'll be, I'll actually lose pretty fast for the next by four or five. And then it'll slow down. Like I dropped three pounds last week. Uh, I'll probably, I'm on pace. I'll drop another three pounds this week, maybe more. And then it'll slowly start to slow down. And then it towards probably by the middle of probably by June, I'm going to hate my life. <laughs> that's going to be, that's just going to be like grinding, just getting it done. Low calorie, lots of cardio, just, just getting through it. But I'm also weird in that. Like I've, I like to do hard things at least once just to say I did it. If nothing more than like bragging rights to myself, like I've done a marathon. Now I never need to do that again. That was ridiculous. I'm never running that far. Um, you know, done tough mutters and things like that. I don't need to do that again. <laughs> once was enough so i can't envision you doing a marathon that's that's wild to me well i was also so i didn't tell all this story in college when i got to college i was really fat like i was like 265 and couldn't do a push-up and i remember standing on the scale my freshman year and seeing 265 and i was like holy crap my 38 pants were getting really tight i was about to go into 40s and i was like you know what i'm just gonna lose weight And I'm a very kind of stubborn person. If I just decide, if I set my mind to something, like it's going to happen. And so I remember going into the gym the next morning and I go, I'm going to run as many laps around this gym as I can until I can't. And I made it six laps. (laughs) It was pathetic. And I said, I had no knowledge of training and nutrition at this point. Okay. So I said, I'm going to add a lap every single day. Don't care how hard it is. So the next day I did seven, next day I did eight. And I just kept running. And nutritionally, I said, I don't know anything about nutrition. I'm eating at the dining hall. And I was like, okay, I'm going to just eat meat and vegetables for six days a week. I'm going to allow myself one day a week to eat what I want. I'm not going to pig out, but I'm going to eat what I want. Ice cream, pie, cake, whatever. And so I ran every day. uh, And I lost in about six months, I lost about 90 pounds. And um, so I got pretty small and I got very fast. I loved running. And then to the point where what got me into lifting weights the first time, the first time I ever touched a barbell was... um, my my sophomore year of college i couldn't run anymore because i'd hurt my 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 groin was killing me. i went to the doctor's office like dude there's like no cartilage there like you wore it away because i went from fat ass to like marathon runner in like six months so i kind of hurt that i was really depressed my god man what am i going to do i lost all this weight and a buddy of mine was like hey come come lift with me and he just started showing me how to lift and of course, again, knowing me, like once I get addicted to something, I was like, oh, I got to be super strong. <laughs> so then that's how I got to listen. Now here we are, you know, some 18 years later. Damn. 
It's wild. It's crazy. That's cool. Yeah, man. So I've been the well, fat kid and I've been the skinny kid. So I, I know what both feel like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I think there's a hell of a lot more stories here. Um, so we'll we'll have to have you on again. For sure. In the future. I definitely want to hear some more stories about uh we didn't even touch on you going to Russia for a strongman competition. <laughs> that was sure, fun. I'm sure there's some, there's some stories there. Dude, there's some stories. <laughs> and, uh, and when you've got this uh this new program laid out we definitely should have you on to talk about it a little bit more for sure i love it oh, we appreciate you coming on uh brad you got any closing thoughts no i mean i was just ask anthony if guys want to connect with you how do they do it where do they go uh instagram is the best spot i'm at anthony 105k pro um yeah, that's my backup page but that's where i'm operating right now because instagram doesn't like me apparently i posted too much uh, anti-covid stuff i guess on my main page <laughs> disclaimer political takes are on this page i can i can attest to yes. <laughs> actually there's very few on my backup page if you go to my yeah, main page it's true. Right? you're really I mean, one that got are you still suspended what happened to that it's one? i don't know it's still alive and i keep it because um it has a lot of followers and some people don't know that i'm not super active on it and they'll still reach out for coaching on there so i check it like once or twice a week uh they said here was what's hilarious to me they said that the reason I got banned is because I actually posted this super inspirational quote and they said it was misattributed. I guess like whoever I said, said it, somebody else said it. And it was like super kind and inspirational. It's like of all the stuff that I have posted <laughs> that you could possibly ban me for, this is what you do. Anyways, it said that my account would be restricted for up to 90 days. So it should have been up at like March 9th or something. And I will, I used to get like 2000 views on a story. And on that page, I get like 50. And on my backup page, I get like 500. So I'm like, I'm just rolling on my backup page now. It is what it is. It is what it is, right? So I guess one, my takeaway quote, this is my uh, Anthony Dealism. It is Uh-oh. be willing to suffer. Yeah. So I think that that's a good synopsis for everything we talked about. Be willing to suffer. Come what may. and love it. Absolutely. I want to just thank everyone for listening. Anthony, again, thank you for joining us. It was a great conversation. For all of our listeners, they can find us on untamingmasculinity.com. Get links to all of our social media there. We're most active on Instagram. Uh, We'll have show notes up for this with all of Anthony's contact info, how to get in touch with him. And um, other than that, we ask that you guys just give us a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. That really helps us get the word out. And other than that, you know, share us on Instagram and social media and tag us so that we can uh, we can see it and and give you props we will see you on the next episode thanks a lot